Well, good morning. Good to see everybody out and about on this beautiful, beautiful first day in September. And for those of you who remember, Roger said to me this morning, this is my fifth anniversary today at Grace Baptist Church. So hard to believe that it's been five years since uh, I came and became a part of this congregation and Bethel came over and became a part of this congregation and we became one congregation and the Lord has been blessing since and we rejoice in what he accomplishes in his faithfulness and in his time. In, it's interesting to me that it would come on Labor Day weekend and you know, working in ministry is a labor but it is a labor that is not in vain if the Lord is the one that's building the house. And that's what we continue to pray, that the Lord be the one that builds the house so that his, this labor will not be in vain. Well, we're going to sing, and I'm not going to play, but I'm going to sing with you guys at the end of the service, one of my favorite hymns of all time, Victory in Jesus. And, you know, I'd be all right, Dan, if you sang all three verses, but it's up to you once you get to that point. But... <laughs> Um, the, the key that I want you to, to get this morning is that we have a great and a grand victory that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. A great and a grand victory. That's the culmination of what Paul has been teaching us in the 15th chapter of Corinthians. Victory in Jesus. Victory over what? In, in the second verse of victory in Jesus, it about how I heard an old, old story. Oh, no, the second verse is, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and gave to me the victory. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. That highlights, in that second verse, that highlights the fact that our body is frail and it is perishing. But yet Christ comes and he, in a small way, in the miracles that he performs, he shows just how much power he has. He has power over the lame to make them walk. He has power over the dumb to make them speak. He has power over the blind to make them see. This is the Christ. And when he comes, he brings with him this power that is invested in him and yet is also inherently in him. So he has it both given and it is already present in him. It is the power of the almighty God of the universe presented to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And he brings about victory. And what do we need victory over? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We need victory. We're real, lasting victory. Paul's been building in his presentation. He began with the gospel in verses 1 to 11. Because victory does not come apart from the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. Then he builds a three-part defense for the resurrection in verses 12 to 34. And then last week we saw Paul's explanation of what we have to look forward to in verses 35 to 49. But this week we are going to see that a miraculous change happens in us because of the victory that Jesus has. So let's read verses 50 to 58 says in verse 50, this is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must 
put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. A brief prayer. Our Father and our God, we pray that you would make the book live to us today as we seek to live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what Paul's driving home? Paul is driving home this message that the dead are going to be raised. The dead are going to be raised and the living are going to be changed. That's the heart of these final verses. That's the mystery that he is going to reveal. The dead are going to be raised and the living are going to be changed. And this change is going to be the final victory over death and sin. And it begins with an incredible truth. The very first thing that we see is in verses 50 to 53. And it is an incredible truth. The incredible truth is the mortal must become immortal. The mortal must become immortal. Do you know what mortal means? It it comes from a root word of morte, which means death. The idea of being dead. We are a dying creature, and we must become an undying creature. We are facing death. We must live life eternally. How do we do that? How do we accomplish that? Well, it's an accomplishment that is found in Christ Jesus. It has, to be, it has to be a radical change that happens in us. So verse 50 acts as a transition verse for us. It transitions us from the bulk of, of Paul's message in 1 Corinthians 15, and it trans, transitions us to the conclusion of his message. In verse 50 he says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now this is an emphatic statement. He is He is saying this in such a way to drive it home. As you are right now, clothed in your mortality, clothed in a dying body, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The body that you have right now is not suited for kingdom of God living. Because the body that you have right now is tainted still with death and it is tainted still with sin. And because of that, it is not suited for immortal living. So that has to change in order for you to inherit what you have coming for you in the future. So what does that mean? This body is never going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's an important statement. This body is never going to inherit the kingdom of God. So that tells us something. It tells us that dead men will not inherit the kingdom of God. Only living men will inherit the kingdom of God. So a radical change must happen to you. When death is defeated and the sinful consequences are finally overcome, there is going to be some change that happens that makes your body move from a mortal body to an immortal body because this mortal body cannot inherit what is coming. So when death is defeated, a trumpet will sound to mark the event. And what you must know is that there are certain promises that you have right now that you're only tasting for a moment. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. There are certain things that you're getting just... Have you ever walked through the kitchen of somebody who was cooking and they held out a spoon to you and they said, here, taste this. And you taste it. And you're like, "Mm -mm. I cannot wait to eat this. What we are experiencing right now as followers of Jesus Christ is just a taste of what we are going to get someday. 
We have begun to taste and see that He is good. We have had a radical change that has happened in our life, but it is not nearly as radical as the change that is going to transition us from mortal to immortal. You cannot experience the fullness of the promises that God has for you because the immortal is not present yet, the immortal flesh. So what Paul is showing us in this passage is a key for us to grab. The flesh and blood could be the living, and corruption could be the dead. So Paul could be telling us that no matter what state your body is in at the trumpet, it must be radically changed. Burial doesn't purify you. Baptism doesn't purify you. Living a life for Jesus does not give you an edge over somebody else. What we do recognize is that something has to happen. Ultimately, the dead and the living must have something that changes in order for them to enter into the kingdom of God. So I believe what Paul is really explaining to us is that if you are only in the first Adam, then death and sin still hold dominion over you. If you are only in the first Adam, then death and sin still hold dominion over you. And those who remain only in the first Adam will only ever have death and sin to inherit. That's all that they have to look forward to are the consequences eternally in hell. And we begin to think to ourselves, okay, that's pretty bleak. Every single person that is born inherits Adam's nature. So that means they get both a desire to sin and also an original sin that is inherently in them. They are sinners by birth, and then whenever they get the chance to choose, they are sinners by choice. That's what we are in the first Adam. That is a terrible state to live in. And that estate will not allow us to inherit the eternal estate. So in verses 51 to 53, Paul says, let me tell you, as he transitions, he says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Corruption cannot inherit incorruption. He says, let me tell you a mystery. I am going to show you. Behold, look, pay attention to this fact that I am going to show you a mystery. Now, what is this mystery that he's showing us? He's not showing us something that is hidden, but he is showing us something that is now revealed. Christianity is not a mystery religion. You understand that? Let me put it to you this way. There are some people who have this mentality that, well, I just know something you don't know. Have you ever met Christians like this? I just know something you don't know. The Lord spoke to me. I know something that you don't know. And it's not been revealed to you. It's a mystery to you. Christianity is not a mystery religion. Christianity is a revealed religion. It is revealed to us in the B-I-B-L-E. God says, look and see what I have for you. And Paul says, here's the mystery that is revealed. What is the mystery that is revealed? Well, first, he says, we shall not all sleep. So what is he saying? There has to be some questioning that's going on in the minds of the believers in the first century as to how things are going to play out. We have those questions today, don't we? We want to know, when is Jesus coming? We sing the song, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. When? When is he coming? We don't know. The first century church must have had the question because he said he's coming quickly. So what happens when the first Christian dies? Did you ever think about that? So you've been told that Jesus Christ, you've seen him resurrect from the dead. You've seen him with your eyes. You've handled him with your hands. You've, you've seen this. Ex- you've experienced this. And you say, now, because of what he has accomplished, we have victory over death. And then the first Christian 
draws their last breath. And you stand over that body. And you say, okay, how is this victory over death? Do you ever think about that? These are thoughts that the first church had to wrestle through. This is what had to be explained to them. This is what they had to come to embrace. Listen, since the first Christian died until today, we have stood by the graves of those who have claimed Jesus as their Savior and who have recognized that they have victory over death and sin, and yet sin still puts them down into a grave. Death still consumes them. The grave still envelops them, and the grave seems to have the victory. Samuel and I take the time to give our relatives haircuts, you know, down at the family cemetery. And there is victory there that grave has for a moment. Grave has them enveloped. Grave has his arms wrapped around them and will not let them go. They cannot, under their own power, sit up out of grave and have a conversation with us. So how do we as Christians view this? How do we look at this? How do the first Christians view this? Well, Paul says, here is the mystery that is revealed to you. You shall not all sleep. What does that mean? Remember, what does Paul consistently like and sleep to? Only for the believer. Not for the unbeliever. For the unbeliever, the unbeliever dies. But the believer sleeps. The unbeliever dies, the believer sleeps. And so what is he saying? He's saying, for the unbeliever, he is wrapped not in the arms of grave finally, but he is only sleeping. And he says, we shall not all sleep. So this is another mystery that he's giving forth to us. What is the other mystery? That there's going to be a point in history when Christ comes back and there are going to be Christians who are in two different estates. Some are going to be in the grave, and some are going to be out of the grave. And what's going to happen at that point? How do we change? How do we who have not died, how do we change? How do we shed mortal and put on immortality? How does this affect or play out in our lives? Listen, I tell you, I, I try to talk with Stacy sometimes. Uh, you know, once in a while we talk. <laughs> And, and I try to talk with her and say, okay, this is, this is what I want you to do at my funeral. And she'll say to me, no, we're not talking about your funeral. And I'll say, well, you know, statistically speaking, men typically die before women. And she says, no, no, I demand that I go first. <laughs> now, she usually gets what she wants. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> But even though we talk about these things, really in my heart, I'm not looking for the undertaker, I'm looking for the upper taker. I don't want to die. <laughs> but I want to change from this mortal into the immortal. And Paul says there is going to be a point where there are going to be Christians who are both asleep in the grave, and there are going to be Christians who are alive and walking around, and at that same point, there is going to have a, or, or be a change that happens to them. We shall all be changed. Whether you are dead or alive, you shall be changed. How quickly is it going to happen? Well, it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Some people have tried to record and clock, and, and they're saying, well, Paul's saying in this amount of time. No, Paul is not saying in this amount of time. Paul's saying it's just going to be quick. It's going to be quick. Stacy said to me the other day, she said, what about your grandmother? Because half of grandma's in Texas, <laughs> and the other half of grandma is sitting on the mantle at my grandfather's house. And she said, how's that going to work? And I said, I don't know, but it'll happen in the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> That's what we know. That it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. As quick as you blink, the mortal will be made immortal. The idea of the, the living will be made imperishable. 
the living will be made imperishable. Is that not exciting for you this morning? The living will be made imperishable. You know, I realize that there are some geriatric folks here today. <laughs> but you know, that, that some of you could be just as easily ministered to by AARP, you know. <laughs> How does that play out in your life? The breaking down will no longer break down. Isn't that exciting? Well, how, if we move from our first thought of how the mortal will put on immortality, and we see that the corruptible will put on incorruption, and the mortal puts on immortality, then how does Paul say this is going to happen in front of everybody? Well, he says the second uh, uh, incredible truth that we see is that everyone will see Christ's victory. We see this in verses 54 to 57. Everyone will see Christ's victory. So in this second incredible truth, Paul moves from the mystery that is being revealed, that we are going to change quickly, that this is going to happen at the last trump, for the trumpet is going to sound, and the dead are going to be raised, and they are going to be raised in an incorruptible way, and we will all be changed, for this, incorruptible, or for this corruptible must put on incorruption. In verse 54, he transitions, and he says, So, when? And I love that. We see that Paul anticipates this transition. He doesn't say if, he says when. The first victory is not a matter of if, but it is a matter of when. That should cause us as the believers to anticipate and live our lives in light of the truth that there is a when. That there is a moment in time that is coming when Christ will take our corruptible and make it incorruptible. We are mortal, but we are bound for immortality. We're uncertain of the time frame, but we are absolutely certain of the event. When? When? It will happen. He speaks of it as if it is a done deal. We will have our mortal garment exchanged for an immortal garment. When we are clothed in immortality, there is more than just the transition to a new body that's going to happen. Not only are we going to get, and, and this is, so we've spent a lot of time talking about the fact that we're going to get a new body. But we are not only going to get a new body. Let me tell you what else we're going to get. A new ethic. Did you hear that? We are going to get a new ethic. So not only will I put off mortal, I will put off corruption. That, for the believer, should be even more exciting than the breaking down of the flesh. Because if you're here this morning and you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and it's on Him that you are depending for every breath, you recognize that you fail Him in so many ways. We were driving down yesterday to my wife's uncle's funeral and as we were driving down, I turned the radio on and I tried this. You know, did you ever do that where you're just pushing the button on the radio, hoping that at some point something of value will come on? And at no point was anything of value coming on. And I stopped it at K Love. And I, I'm not a fan of K Love, but they were playing a song that I liked. And I listened to it. And then the song that came on immediately after it was all about me. And how one day I'll stand before the Lord and he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And it was all about how great that's going to feel. That he's going to say, well done. And that all this work that I've done for him is going to be rewarded. As I was driving, I thought to myself, when the Lord says to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant, that's going to be the most undeserved sentence 
that he's going to utter. Do you hear that? If you think that you deserve him saying to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you've missed the point. Christianity is not about you. It is about him. And he, in his glorious graciousness, has received you as his own. That's incredible. It's not about what I've accomplished for him. It's about what he's accomplished for me. It's not about me getting so excited to hear him say, well done. I'm thinking to myself that that might be a moment where I have this moment of regret where I'm thinking to myself of all the things that I could have done for him. Of all the things that I didn't do for him. But yet we try in our own way to, to, to make heaven about what we're going to get instead of heaven being about him and him being glorified and him being exalted and him being the one that we look just like. Do we live in light of that truth? While we have spent these past weeks considering the fact that we will get a new body, I think it's far more exciting to say this. There's coming a day when I will have no more sin. When it will not be a struggle for me with my tongue. When it will not be a struggle me with my eyes or with my hands or with my mind or with my feet when there will be no more flesh to fight against when there will be no more corruption because it has become incorruption when there will be no more victories that sin has over me but it will be all swallowed up in victory in Jesus and all of the sin will be gone away and all of the struggle will disappear Yes, I'm going to get a new body, but what's even more exciting is I'm going to get a new ethic. And I will never, ever, ever, ever sin against my Lord again. I will never, ever, ever shame him again. I will never, ever, ever do anything that would cause him to blush or to disown or to turn his face away. It will all be swallowed up in his victory. And it will be all about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Wow. That should cause you to anticipate. That could, should cause you to wait with excitement. That's what we should long for as Christians. Not just the putting off of the immortality, but a putting off of sin. Living with the struggles and temptations of sin in this world is burdensome. And part of what we look forward to at the resurrection is the complete absence of sin. The complete absence of sin. That's exciting. And that's tied to Christ's victory. Christ's victory is not merely over death. Christ's victory is over sin as well. Now I recognize that presently, according to Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 8 and verse 1, that presently I have no condemnation in Christ, but while I have no condemnation in Christ, while I am here in this earth, I experience a battle with sin. And this battle with sin has been permanently won with Christ, but it is yet to be won in my life. But there is coming a day... Paul quotes Hosea 13 and verse 14 to drive the concept home when he says there is coming a day when death will be swallowed up in victory and we will say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? What is the, the sting of death? Well, it is sin. What is the strength of sin? It is the law. So he lays out to us that the sting will be removed and that the grave will lay empty. The sting is, in Greek, likened to the sting of a scorpion. And that's tied to sin. That sting will be removed from us. And one day, as I, 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 I mow over my 
grandparent's grave, and my grandparents love Jesus, and I'm glad that that is the testimony that I have, that my grandparents love Jesus. And I recognize that one day that the arms that the grave has around them will have to release them, and their graves will stand empty because the grave will not have the final victory. Wow. The grave will not have the final victory. We could put it this way. The grave does not get the period in the sentence. The grave does not get the period in the sentence. The strength of sin is the law. What does that mean? Well, sin is revealed our imperfections are revealed by the law. They are, they are revealed in such a way that they point us to the need of a perfect Savior. So we need to not be in that first Adam that we talked about earlier. We need to be in the last Adam, who is Jesus Christ. Because the law reveals our imperfections, we begin to know this and recognize this, that we need Jesus. And the judgment of God declares us sinful. So the law has revealed God's character and his expectation of me. The law has revealed to me that I am a failure. The law reveals to you that you are a failure. If we even just take the ten commandments of the law, we recognize from that that we are a failure. We are blasphemers. We are idolaters. We are... Uh, murderous in our thoughts and in our intents. And it crops up so suddenly in us. It flashes into our minds in ways that we wouldn't believe. But the revealed victory of Jesus Christ tells us that the death that we cowered in front of has been destroyed. Death fatally will sting me if the Lord tarries, and the grave will for a time victoriously hold me, and without Jesus, the law would have eternally damned me. But in Jesus Christ, I have been made a partaker of victory. Victory. This is the gift of God. This is the gospel revealed. I cannot earn it. He alone can bestow it. And when he returns, this will all become visible in front of everybody. That's what we're going to remember when we take communion. The victory of Jesus Christ. The final thing that we see, the final incredible truth, is really an application in verse 58. Be steadfast. This is Paul's conclusion of his whole sermon that has lasted for all of chapter 15. All of chapter 15 has pushed forward to this one encompassing application, and Paul breaks it down three different ways. He says, first, be steadfast. We must serve the Lord, serve the Lord with a steadfast heart. Paul is no longer sarcastic. He is no longer rhetorical. He is no longer arguing for the re resurrection. The point has been made. Now he lays out this brilliant treatise, and he says, what are you going to do with it? This information has a life-changing effect. Has it changed your life? It's incredible to me how many Christians believe that theological doctrine is not anything other than information. I saw a fantastic commercial this morning. It's hard to believe, you know, you just don't see fantastic commercials anymore. But I saw this fantastic commercial and it was from a bank. And this bank had it just, just perfect the way they worded it. They said, boring when done well changes things. And they said, we have been successfully boring for how many hundreds of years? And because of that, you guys have been able to go on vacation. You guys have been able to do this. You've been able to build your houses. You've been able to do all of this because we have been successfully boring at the bank. And I thought to myself, that's fantastic. <laughs> you don't think about the nuts and bolts of these things sometimes. You just enjoy the benefits of them. 
when it comes to theology, people are like, ah, I don't want to hear that theological stuff. But this is what Paul has laid out for us. And the end result of it should be that we rejoice and we worship. Paul presumes that you will serve Jesus because of this information that has been given. So let me put it to you this way. The Bible never conceives of a Christian that does not serve. So Paul presumes you will serve. And in order for you to serve, you must be steadfast. Paul loves the Corinthians. He wants to see them changed by the information that he has given. Instead of them being the doubters that they were back in verse 12, he wants to see them steadfast. Not only does he want to see them steadfast, he wants to see them immovable. So while with steadfast, we have a mindset of being settled in what we believe, with unmovable, we have the concept of not swaying or turning from what we believe. So Paul doesn't want the Corinthians to be shifting from the hope of the gospel. And that's my desire for you guys. I don't want to see you shifting from the hope of the gospel. I want to see you rejoicing in what you know. I want to see you planted in the truth. Because that leads to the third word, abounding. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. If you are steadfast, if you are unmovable, then you will abound in the work of the Lord. I thought about this. How many of you would describe yourself as I am abounding in the work of the Lord? Have you thought about that? When it comes to service, the call to serve, how many of you would say, that fits me, I am abounding in the work of the Lord? If you would not describe yourself this way, then why don't you change it? Why aren't you abounding in the work of the Lord? Is it too hard? Is there too much for you to give up? Is there too much churchiness? I don't want to be too much at church. Paul says, abound in God's work. It's not a concept that he says, just leave it off to the side. He concludes that this work is not a vain work. So how do we conclude? Simply this way. We live actively in the present because of what we know is coming in the future. We keep moving and working and serving now because we know what's coming then. So how, how, how do we see this? Well, we see it in our praise and worship. It's influenced by the resurrection. Our service is influenced by the resurrection. Our joy is influenced by the resurrection. Our theology is influenced by the resurrection. And we sing out with Miss Crosby, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Heir of salvation. Do you have that blessed assurance? Do you know victory through Jesus? Maybe Mr. Wesley said it best in his final verse of love divine, all love's excelling. He says, changed from glory, I've been saved, into glory. I will be immortal. Till in heaven we take our place. Till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder and in grace. Wow. That's our future hope. That is the joy of the resurrection. So let us work until he comes. Let's pray, and then we'll turn in 1 Corinthians to chapter 11 and read. As the men come for communion. Our Father and our God, your people have heard your word today, and it is up to them to render the verdict. Do they judge God's word to be true and trustworthy and worthy of following, or do they judge it to be a lie? Do the people here at Grace believe in themselves that they have some special excuse that excludes them from working for you? Are they willing to ignore the very command of the Most High God? That is what is at stake this morning, Lord. 
It's their decision, Lord, merely the herald. We pray, Father, that each one here would hear the truth and be moved by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 11, it says, 